Imagine an entire city district instantly emptied of people. This would be a little bit like what Manhattan felt like after Hurricane Sandy, when everything south of 14th Street was deserted due to the blackouts. A place like this exists here in Cyprus, except on a much larger scale. In this case, Manhattan is Famagusta, and the fenced-off, deserted area is Varosha. The big difference here is that Varosha has been abandoned for 40 years, and there's an army preventing people from going home. Imagine it's 1974, and you're home, and you rush out of town because you're fearing that the Turkish army will arrive in your town as well. It's already taken over other parts of your island. You leave everything behind, thinking you'll be back the next day, only to find out later that they've taken your city as well and fenced off six square kilometers in barbed wire, your home included. They've kept it as a political bargaining chip, and 40 years later, you're still waiting to go home. This is what happened to thousands of Greek Cypriots from Famagusta, including my mother and my grandparents. Now imagine you're a Turkish Cypriot living in the south, and you're told to flee north towards this army that says it's there to protect your people from the rising Greek fundamentalism. You're told to move into a home belonging to somebody else. Their pictures still hang on the wall, the toys are out on the floor, and the food is half eaten in the kitchen. This is your new home, and across the street from you is an abandoned ghost town. Clearly, both communities have been displaced and experienced loss. And Varosha serves no Cypriot today, except maybe the abandoned sea turtles that have resettled the beaches since humans left. The Greek Cypriots live in the past with an open wound and psychological trauma, while the Turkish Cypriots have to live the daily injustice of this place, with rats, mice, and snakes coming into their backyards. An unrecognized state, they remain alienated, recognized only by Turkey, so they have no future prospects. Here's a short video to give you a sense of what this place feels like today. An amazing opportunity lies behind the tragic reality of this place. But first, let me tell you why I've devoted the past 11 years of my life obsessively following Famagusta. As you already know, my mother's childhood home is in there. In fact, I think my parents' wedding gifts were left unwrapped in the attic when, when the family fled. But it was never her home or her gifts that she lamented, but more the loss of a lifestyle a lifestyle connected to nature and to community. Her memories of this place were so vivid that I often have to remind myself that I never actually lived there myself. She spoke of it like it was heaven on earth, a thriving city ahead of its time. It had the island's first train and windmills that drew water from deep aquifers. It had citrus groves that inspired orange festivals and beautiful white sand beaches that brought the tourists and the city's recent wealth, along with the main port and center for trade and commerce. It was artistic and cultured and historically rich, housing the ancient amphitheater of Salamis, the archaeological ruins of Engomi, 
and the beautiful Venetian walled city, a stunning memorial to the countless civilizations and conquerors who have landed on this shore. Shakespeare was even inspired to base Othello in Famagusta. That's how amazing it was. This place only really existed in my fantasy, though, until 20, 2003, when the Turkish army finally slackened restrictions at the checkpoint in a historic move, allowing people to move freely between the two sides. I was able to cross north for the first time and see it with my own eyes. This experience, while being both shocking and saddening to see this paradise as a wasteland, was mostly motivating for me. I became obsessed with Famagusta, and she took me as her captive. I spent years compulsively filming at every chance I could get, disregarding all the signs that prohibited cameras. And while making my first documentary, Hidden in the Sand, I had the chance to meet many Turkish Cypriots for the first time, which for me was one of the most incredible experiences of my life, because they were Cypriots as I'd always known them, generous, soulful, and alive. Certainly not the scary enemy that my four years in Greek Cypriot public school taught me about. But there are some amazing stories connected to this city that show that there's a force that Cypriots are man have managed to remain connected across the divide despite the separation. One of these stories involves my aunt's wedding photo album, which was left at the home in Famagusta and somehow showed up in London 20 years later. A Turkish Cypriot who'd been living in the home ended up taking it there with the hopes that somehow it would get back to the family. And lo and behold, the priest at the church recognized the photograph of my aunt, of my uncle's wedding photo, and returned it to the family. One of my favorite stories involves Baki, a, Greek, a Turkish Cypriot artist and architect who was hired by the Turkish army to go inside and survey homes inside Varosha. He stumbled upon the studio of Andy, a Greek Cypriot artist whose talent he immediately recognized. And he ended up later sneaking in at his, at his own risk to retrieve some of the artworks and got a UN soldier to return the work to the family. This, these kinds of stories prove that the older generation of Cypriots remember what it's like to be united. Unlike my generation, which has been kept apart by the politics of separation, which is why the idea that I'm here to talk to you about today is so important at this point in our history. The most transformative part of this journey for me was the afterthought that my mother left at the end of our conversations about Fumagusta. The what if. That place where reality meets imagination and gives rise to possibility. Instead of dwelling in the past, it looked to the future for once. What if we can revive Famagusta as Europe's model eco-city? What if we can right the wrongs of the past while leapfrogging into a future of responsible resource management, energy independence, local resilience and self-sufficiency for the sake of our collective survival? Never in the history of the world has a militarily occupied ghost city been revived in this way? Never has the creation of an eco-city been used as a unifying tool for divided communities. Never has a historic city at the crossroads of three continents provided the perfect platform for a new environmental paradigm to emerge. That one what if, that she planted in my mind was enough to inspire an incredible team to come together, a plan to be made, and a frenzy of media and action around this idea. The Famagusta EcoCity project was born. At the beginning, I really had no idea what I was doing. People would ask what we're about, and I could barely answer the question. Um, it was all way out of my league and felt like lunacy to pursue something that had every odd stacked against it. But I trusted my instinct, my best advisor, and I answered the call. And suddenly, doors started opening left and right, because that's what happens when you answer the call. I started making my second film until I realized that there was no story in a mere idea and a bunch of abandoned buildings. We, as Famagustians, had to make the story happen together. 
all of us. 63 Greek and Turkish Cypriots came together for an architectural design studio launch that we had. And they were bicommunal groups that jointly presented their, their visions for a unified Famagusta ecocity to a group of Cypriot and American students who then started the designs. It was an incredible atmosphere, so positive, and people united around this shared goal as opposed to focusing on their differences. Preserving culture and nature can be that shared goal for people all around the planet. Our need to survive as a species is our one and only unifier, regardless of race, economic status, or religious and cultural beliefs. It's not accidental that so many young people have wanted to get involved in this project. They see the world that they're inheriting, and they're afraid. Our resources are disappearing, our health is being compromised, and our leaders are not pursuing seriously the alternatives. With the speed at which people are moving to the cities these days, we have to make them more resilient, adaptable, and hospitable. This takes foresight and planning, which is why we have to start now with Famagusta. We can't wait until it opens up and then suddenly everyone's jumping on it. We need to protect it now. Imagine if the designers of Manhattan didn't think to set aside that space for Central Park. What would New York City feel like today? Not a place I'd want to live. Perhaps it would have never become the cultural mecca that it is had it lacked its central sanctuary. Some people feel threatened when we say eco-city. They think we're going to tear their homes down or turn, make chicken coops out of them and make the city a completely different city, nothing like what it was before. This couldn't be further from the truth. The memory and essence of this town and its people is exactly what we want to preserve. Famagusta was a much more sustainable community than what Cyprus has to offer today. People actually used windows and the sea breeze to cool their homes. They sat on their balconies and chatted with their neighbors. They ate locally grown food, and they walked and rode their bicycles. When you ask people about Famagusta, what they miss most, the one thing they always bring up are the smells of the city, how the air smelled of citrus and jasmine. Well, these are smells of nature when left to flourish, when we don't pour concrete over everything. We have one of the most unique, historic, and naturally beautiful islands in the world. Why are we trying to make it look like every other place on Earth? By surrounding ourselves with green space, trees, birds, animals, we become kinder, happier people. Nature and beauty heal. Famagusta could offer us this lifestyle again if we start planning now. It could, it could be a city designed primarily for pedestrians and mass transit and bicycles, not centered around cars. We're not saying no cars, just limit them within the city limits to make space for other things. It could be a highly artistic and cultured city, like it always was. It could create actual careers for the youth, not just menial service industry jobs that come and go with the season, from everything from production of local products, development of alternative technologies, the possibilities are endless. This kind of city could pull Cyprus out of its economic recession in an instant. Well, not in an instant, but, you know, take some work. We need, clean, we need clean drinking water to survive. This, we have a big water shortage problem in Cyprus. This would be a city that tackles its water shortage through rainwater harvesting and proper wastewater management. It would be a city mostly dependent on renewable energy. It makes absolutely no sense that 95% of our energy on this island comes from fossil fuels, limited fossil fuels that are running out. We have a big, bright, beautiful sun shining down on us almost every day of the year. Why don't we use it? It's raining gold on us daily. Let's cash it in. So, why does Famagusta in particular offer us such a rare opportunity? For one, there's a pre-existing infrastructure in place that needs to be revived after 40 years, but the entire city and region of Famagusta must be involved if this is to work. We're not just popping up a city in the desert here. 
So the idea is that we're creating a unified Famagusta eco-city, not a Varosha eco-city. We need an oasis of hope and peace in the region, the highly, highly, highly troubled region. Everybody needs an example of something that works. Why can't it be this? We, we are a small enough country where this could get widespread support quickly, and the investment would be manageable. We have access to EU resources from surrounding environmentally progressive nations, and we could become a global leader in research and development of alternative technologies of education. The possibilities are endless. Living on an island is like living on a boat. You have to be sustainable. It's natural to resist change, but this change is like taking medicine that tastes bad, or exercising when you'd rather sit on the couch with a bowl of ice cream. You do it knowing that it could prevent you from a deadly infection or a heart attack, knowing that it could secure your children's future. So, what story will we tell? How will the film end? Can we turn a symbol of war, division, loss, hatred, and apathy into a symbol of hope, reunification, abundance, and peace? Many people say, why not? And because we create our reality with our thoughts and with our language, perhaps we should keep thinking this and keep saying it. Perhaps it could undo maybe some of the negative sloganeering that's been so carefully crafted on both sides of the divide as a weapon against peace. Maybe everything we know is in fact wrong and we should admit it. From our lifestyle choice to our choice of who to listen to and what to believe in. Perhaps the seed for this eco-city was always hiding inside Varosha's fences. And maybe those sea turtles that have resettled the beaches are sending us a message, and we may want to listen. We may want to listen, we may want to look, we may want to smell and think. This is a new era, so let's take the call. Thank you.